So our, our first speaker is Dr. Johan Dendel. No, Johan Dendel. Um, he actually came all the way over from the scene to talk to you guys. So. Um, I could read this full bio, but you also have it. But he, um, you know, just the long and short of it, he has um, a lot of interest and expertise in some of the more extreme sports that we're going to tell you about today. So he's actually done some some research in the MMA maybe that looks specifically at the effects of um, skydiving and scuba diving, so then the screens of altitude on political uh, regulation and uh, hopefully you'll have any questions for him. Thank you very much, Sherry. Uh, and it's very, very nice to be here. Thank you, Peter, for inviting me. Um, and uh, the question is actually, is it advisable for people with uh, diabetes to participate in sports such as scuba diving and skydiving? And what do authorities say about this? Is it okay here in the States, all over the world? Are there, there are places where you cannot perform your sport? And also, what evidence and guidance is there uh, to help those who are performing uh, these uh, activities? But uh, let's look into physical activity uh, as it is. And, and we know that the US Department of Health and Human Services suggests that all uh, people do involve in athletic activities and suggests that one uh, has uh, 150 minutes per week of, of moderate intensity or 75 minutes per week of, of vigorous aerobic physical activity uh, to improve uh, the general health. And for uh, type 1s, uh, the suggestions are similar with uh, 115 minutes per week of moderate intensity uh, spread over at least three days per week with, and that is important, uh, no more than uh, two uh, consecutive days without exercise. And the scientific level for this is high with a grade A. That means that there's a lot of clinical studies showing beneficial effects. For type 2s, it's a bit more complicated since uh, with that disease, it's more common with cardiovascular uh, disease and the risk uh, in connection to, to physical activities. So if you do have multiple risk factors for cardiovascular disease and diabetes, uh, you should be very careful with physical activities. But for those who do not have these, it's uh, encouraged to perform resistance activity twice per week. Mm -hmm. Also, there are two documents, the St. Vincent Declaration and the Disability Act here in the States, asking uh, us all to life independence, work for uh, removing obstacles and hindrance for people with diabetes to perform in various activities, either with their work or uh, on their uh, leadership time. Uh, but let's move to, to the sports and diabetes. Is it possible to become a top athlete when having diabetes? Uh, Peter showed some examples uh, earlier. And, and what guidance uh, is there to be given from the health care provider? Uh, is it the correct ones? Are you encouraged or disencouraged to perform uh, athletic mm -hmm. And what about risk sports? Is that something to go with? And talking about risks, and this is a picture from outside Gothenburg a couple of years ago. Uh, I was sailing and, and, and uh, caught up with this uh, Viking ship. And you can imagine with a ship this size, not very big, uh, going for the quest for uh, a land that is possibly there, crossing the Atlantic with all the storms and so on. And this could only be achieved by very careful preparation and 
uh, a big portion of courage uh, and preparations. And, and with that, I think that it's the same with uh, physical activity and sports. And uh, from a Swiss perspective, there are also many top athletes winning many medals from international uh, contests in various sports. Yeah. And this despite the fact that, that they do have diabetes. It does not hinder them from winning uh, very uh, high or, or, or uh, gold and bronze medals in, in Olympic Games and, and World Championships. So everything is possible. But there will always be the delicate balance of food and insulin. Uh, and with the danger depicted with the shark being the hyper by Robert here. And that is kind of the other side of the coin, because when you do sport, you will actually increase the risk of hyper. And you need to know how to counteract to, to avoid this. So despite the fact that you do have a lot of uh, benefits from a health perspective, there is a risk that, that high flows uh, increase. And I, I would assume that, that you will agree with me on this. Uh, continuous glucose monitoring was also mentioned this morning. And it's a really good tool to understand how you react and the body response on uh, physical activity. And, and finger pricking uh, is actually a value here and now, but it does not really tell you what are you coming from, which levels did you have, and where are you heading at. And uh, with CGM and with 288 measurements a day, up to six to seven days, really gives you a very good picture. And it could both uh, be able to, to warn you about an oncoming low episode or oncoming high episode. And also, if you're already there, uh, it, it will help you to, to make the time spent in hypo or hypo, hyper for less. Uh, and also uh, the level, how low or how high you go. Uh, some use these all the time, continuously. On the other hand, we know from both uh, clinical studies and from real life that many people use them intermittently. Uh, and it also varies a lot between different countries regarding reimbursement and so on. And, and and the sensors do add up to, to quite considerable sums. So, so many uses these uh, a few weeks during practice and during their uh, competitions in order to, to uh, be able to, to level their, their glucose in, in, in a better way. Uh, and also, if we look at the, at the crystal ball, uh, there will be much further improvements with these. We will go from one week to four weeks. We will go from uh, CGM where you do not need to calibrate uh, on a daily basis, but only once. And, uh, Along the line, yeah, they will do, have something called the redundant technique, so they, they have different measurement techniques, and they choose the ones who is most uh, robust at that point of time. Uh, so we will see a lot of uh, progress here in, in, in the coming years. To give you an idea about uh, how one can use this, it's not only to, to be able to track patterns here now, uh, 
this is uh, from, from a patient of mine. Uh, he's a soccer player and uh, a young guy, and he was very well controlled, uh, but he had problems when he was uh, having his games or when he was more active with, with excursions. So we did a check uh, with CGM on an active week and he's just perfectly balanced here. Uh, I see that I did not put uh, milligrams per deciliter here with no bones. <laughs> Sorry for that. But uh, this would be, I think, uh, 70 to 140 watt. Uh, the division, or, or you multiply with 18.18. Um, when he was more active, you see a very clear pattern that, that, that uh, he has his excursions over the day, Oops. Uh, up and down, and he compensates, of course, and then uh, late uh, night and early morning, he has a tendency of, of being the, uh, the threshold uh, or the definition of, of hypo is usually set at 3.9 no most uh, using the 88 criteria. However, when he's very active, he goes to a camp, what happens then? Well, then it's even further uh, more clear that, that he has these excursions and, and he's being uh, very low uh, in over night. This becomes a bumper. The bumper. Was it a, a pumper or was this? Uh, uh, he, he has a pump, but this was uh, some years ago, so it, it did not have a low glucose uh, suspend on this one. Uh, so the suggestion, of course, here was to, to you, you should refrain from, from, from the activity altogether and just uh, <laughs> sit down and, and uh, play his uh, computer games, but uh, no, we did not do that. <laughs> and I will give you some, some, some uh, insight in, in what we're advising our patients to do. Uh, many, uh, when performing uh, any physical activity have a tendency of, of safening up a bit and, and, and uh, just, you know, I'll stick to a little higher level in, in, in glucose than, than uh, I should perhaps do. But, but uh, current data is actually that, that you should avoid that. You should aim at a good level. Uh, so 90 to 144. Uh, is uh, to be the aim of glucose level prior to any physical activity. But <coughs> it depends uh, on your glycogen uh, stores in, in liver and muscle uh, tissue. And, and if you have high stores that is have not been physically active the day before, and you had regular breakfast and lunch and, and you're pretty sure that you're, you're uh, full in your uh, muscles, then you could uh, even go further down 90 to 108 uh, prior to physical activity. But if you're on the other hand, you were having a, 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 a go at your bike or what have you the night before, and, and um, you've only had breakfast, then you're probably not fully restored in your glycogen uh, levels in, in your muscles. You have about 400 <coughs> grams of, of glycogen in, in your muscles. Uh, and we come back to how long they last. Then you need to, to push this level a little higher and, and perhaps aim at 126 to 144 instead. Uh, Are we allowed to interrupt you and just ask yeah. questions? That was my first question. <laughs> <laughs> Glycogen stores. So I, I don't know much about it. I know that you replenish them after exercise and whatnot. What does it take to refill a glycogen store? Like, is it just a matter of having enough chocolate milk, or does it take a bit of time? Does it take a few meals? I'll come back to that okay. uh, in a minute. But it's I think it, it is interesting, and you do have you do have energy for. 
one hour of, of uh, uh, intense exercise. Then you're out of like you have to switch. But I'll come back to that. Okay, thank you. And if I don't, uh, remind me. One more question along those lines. Yeah. yeah. The, doesn't the type of physical activity exactly. matter? I mean, if if you're going to go run as fast as you can for 35 minutes versus you know start a marathon, I mean, it, it, the level of activity doesn't that matter? Intensity. As well, the intensity. The intensity it matters a lot, and, and the, you know yourself that, that you cannot compare uh, when you have uh, interval uh, training with endurance training. So that is also one thing that that you need to make note of, uh, just like the diver makes note of how much. Uh, uh, air you consume and how much blood you need to, to be uh, buoyancy, have good buoyancy. You also need to make notes of, of uh, how you adjust your insulin doses and your carbohydrate uh, replenishment when, 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 uh, when doing different sorts of activity. But, but yes, it differs a lot. And, and what you can do is actually uh, to to monitoring your heart rate, uh, and that's a very good idea of, of showing the intensity, uh, the percent of maximal heart rate. And that's a very good idea of, of, of uh, knowing what intensity this activity uh, is going to be classified. Well, for pump, uh, we usually recommend when you do activities with uh, long endurance, and that is longer than, than 60 minutes, um, and also varying intensity. And that is, with the pump, you do have a lot more uh, possibilities to uh, fine tune uh, insulin dosing. However, uh, for some sports like, like yeah, contact sports, it could be difficult with, with uh, a pump. Uh, ice hockey, American football, and so on. Uh, some prefer pen in, in this case. Regarding water sports, until just recently it was not allowed in, in Australia, for instance, to use an insulin pump if you were a swimmer. Uh, but that just changed uh, last month, I think. So, so it, it, it differs, and, and also one must understand that, that insulin pumps, despite that it says they're uh, waterproof, they're only waterproof down to 3.5 meters, uh, so it's not for diving, it's only for swimming. And carbohydrates, <coughs> during activity, one needs to refuel to keep the the, uh, the wheels turning and, and uh, I would say that carbohydrates is the most important factor uh, together with those reductions of insulin to bond hypoglycemia. This is especially the case when you have physical activity over one hour. Because usually, again, depending on the intensity, you run out of your glycogen stores uh, after 45 to 60 minutes. And then you have to switch to, to fat. Uh, as the primary energy source. But fat is combusted in the, in the flame of, of carbohydrates. You still need carbohydrates to use fat as uh, an energy source. So, and this is irrespectively if you have diabetes or if you don't. So that's one of the reasons we all hit the wall uh, around that time if you have not uh, fueled up uh, over time with, with carbohydrates and uh, you cannot make the switch from, from carbohydrates to fat. Uh, the other question is, if you do have a pump, should it be on or should it be off? Uh, during physical activity. And this is, there are some places here, so you're in the back there, just skip down. I have seen. Is the, is the ice melting or, or freezing? Uh, 
I would like to, to focus a bit on, on this slide. And uh, this, this is actually very helpful trying to understand uh, the thoughts. Again, the target for, for uh, uh, glucose levels in no time per deciliter. The meal should be uh, two to three hours prior to the exercise. And uh, during exercise, again, you have to refuel with uh, about 0.3 to 0.9 grams per kilo per hour in order to, to keep balance. Uh, it's very important that you right after uh, the exercise uh, have carbs, uh, usually a couple of fruits, uh, bananas, 15 to, to perhaps a big banana, 20 grams. Uh, and you should have a meal close to the physical activity. And this, again, irrespective if you have diabetes or not, it's very important if you are going to have repetitive uh, activities over a couple of days, uh, you will be much uh, better in restoring your glycogen stores if you eat uh, within uh, one hour. It's about 3,000 times more efficient like, uh, <coughs> glycogen synthesis uh, compared to if you wait a couple of hours. So you should eat rather than take a shower if you have to make a preference. And also, <laughs> you can shower later on. Uh, and also, uh, one thing that is very uh, clever is to push it a little bit in the beginning so that you don't have a downward trend. And what about insulin then? Well, again, for the meal, of course, a bolus dose, aim at the targets, uh, use a temper, reduce basal rate uh, one to two hours prior to the activity, <coughs> reduced by 20 to 30% above. And uh, during the activity, again, you have to figure out what activity am I uh, going to do and reduce by for moderate intensity, 20 to 30 percent intense, 40 to 50. I have those doing the Basel office, which is a, which is a cross country skiing event, uh, 90 kilometers, uh, and they go down even further. They could reduce with 80 percent, uh, and that also goes for for long uh, biking races like the. You have something called the centennial, right? You go 100, 100 miles. There I would go down even further to perhaps 70 to 80 percent. And then note that uh, the fruit just prior and after, there is no need for, for, for insulin. Uh, and then uh, at the, the meal after an exercise, a bolus dose, usually reduced uh, dose perhaps 50% reduction. And this is often the most difficult part to, to, to decide whether or not you should use a reduced basal rate afterwards. And that depends largely uh, if you have, if you are doing Cisco activities on consecutive days. Uh, usually you have to go down Day one, day two, day three. But after that, you do not need to reduce anymore. The, the first three days are, are critical. Yes? Is that, um, the you go with the glycogen synthesis after exercise, is, is that, you know, sometimes you don't need as much insulin post exercise. You can have some carbs that just seem to, you don't need to bolus for sometimes. Is that because of the glycogen synthesis restoring that, the, uh, the stores in the liver? Well, we, uh, recently, we understood that that uh, the muscles, the uh, uptake of gluco glucose, could be non-insulin dependent. So, if the muscles are totally clean out of, of glycogen, uh, then they will take up uh, uh, carbohydrates 
by themselves without incident. And, and it's the shear stress in the muscles uh, that opens the same uh, glucose transporters, GLUT4, uh, that also insulin is working on, but you do not need insulin for that. I was just wondering, I know you said uh, it's important to have a meal two to three hours before, but uh, if you have a race at seven in the morning and you're not going to get up at four and uh, eat, uh, what would you recommend as an alternative to that? Okay. If you eat just prior to, to, to uh, the race, what use does it do? Very little. On the contrary, it actually, because when you swallow uh, your breakfast, it takes time, because it has to be digested, and it has to be uh, cleaned by enzymes, and then uh, reabsorbed. And uh, what you do is that you shunt blood from your muscles to your gut. Uh, so if you would like to perform good, put your alarm clock up and eat. If you want to perform bad, sleep over. So it's up to you. Um, in the area where you're talking about um, the actual exercise and reducing basils, and then um, replenishing with the 0.3 to 0.9 grams per kilogram per hour. Are you then saying no insulin for the carbs that you're replacing, or take insulin for that? Well, it's, 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 a, very, it's, very, it's a very good question. Uh, again, uh, it could be difficult to, to you know, uh, how, how do you uh, replenish your, your carbs? Is it by gel? Is it by uh, energy drink? Is it by bananas or, or, or raisins or what have you? It depends very much. But if you have peaks, then perhaps uh, you need a little insulin uh, at that time. And we usually do that for our hockey players. And, and sometimes you see that, that you go down. And then all of a sudden, you go up. Uh, and and uh, that could be actually that that you are insulin deficient. Uh, yeah, because that's anyway. very little insulin, and, and so for someone like me, I'm sure everybody's different. For a four, five, six, eight-hour bike ride, for me, I'm not reducing my basils at all. Okay. And, and in fact, it's going up around 10, 10 percent. And I think, and then I'm taking all of that fuel on and not taking insulin for that. Yeah. So that's where. Like I have the insulin to process those carbs and, and that kind of that's always asking because somebody's down 50, 60, 70 percent and taking on 40 grams of carbs an hour just you know mentally. What you do as as this gentleman asked before, uh, you open up a lot right. of glucose uptake that is non-insulin dependent. Uh, so so what you actually but we're different also. Yeah. So so you really have to check and I think yeah. the important issue is not to get behind schedule. Right. It's like uh, dehydration. You have, you have, should never even get there. Right. So, so keep it up. Right. Okay. Uh, excellent. Yes. Yeah, I just had a, a question around the effect of adrenaline. Because like this gentleman over here was asking, like, I'm the crazy one that gets up at 4 in the morning so I can like eat a few hours in advance. And like Felicia, I did the Tough Mudder this year as well. But all of us who did it, the adrenaline, even though I reduced the basil, did all the right things, followed all the right steps, our blood sugars, like every single one of us, it was a team of type ones, were running way high. And when they're having to like constantly correct downwards without correcting too much. But are you gonna talk about that at all? Because with the extreme sports, like whether it's skydiving or anything else, there's that effect of like, holy shit, I'm about to jump out of the plane or whatever, right? So. <laughs> uh, the adrenaline, that's, that's the really bad guys. I mean, they're, they are, uh, uh, they are bank robbers. They really take out all there is in, of glycogen in, in the liver. Uh, they don't. They don't stand in queue and, and wait for their turn. They just go and grab. Uh, and, and that's why you see these high levels. But that does not necessarily mean that you're low in insulin. So how could you check uh, your insulin gauge? Blood ketones, right? Uh, so. Use that as a tool because it's very, it's very easy to, to fall on, on, on uh, I'm high in glucose, 
I must be low on insulin, give an extra little uh, correction dose, and woof, down you go, and uh, the day is boy, or the race is boy. So, so you could actually, and, and that's, we see that especially in, in, in um, I mean, when you have a race situation, uh, and you're all fired up, uh, or if, uh, so, so you should, as closely as possible, mimic the race uh, in your preparations and do as you used to do. And then kind of don't look at those levels, those high levels, because that's your adrenaline and that, that will go away when, when the race starts. So, I think that. so what would you do to correct a high if you're like under an adrenaline circumstance? Would you even, would you do anything to correct that? I mean like... I would be very, very cautious and I will check my, my ketones and, and if... Uh, if you don't have I, the... I don't have any ketones, uh, I would not uh, correct if I'm not, you know, two, 250 or something like that. But if you don't have, but if you can't check your ketones? Because I, I mean, I drive race cars, so... If I'm, if I'm reading 240 inside the race car, I can't, I can't really pick it. <laughs> okay, guys. Uh, 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 yeah. Let's check. Now, of course, it's, it, it's difficult, but, but uh, you have to also re rely on your uh, what has happened. No. Uh, am I right on my insulin doses? Anything particular happened today, yes or no? Or is it uh, only that I'm, I'm very uh, fired up for, for the race? That makes sense. I have a question about the basal reduction that your athletes can go through long periods of time. Yes. Yeah. It's the ones that reduce by 70%. Do you find that they're keeping the basal reduced um, over the one to two hours prior to the activity level? Are they keeping it at 70? No, usually, they usually they start with with thirty uh, minus thirty percent prior to the to the race. But when they start, uh, and it could also be that that halfway in the race they reduce further. So so you really have to. They just go by. Yeah, you have to do your CGM and you have to to, uh, if possible, practice on the same on the race court. Uh, See how, how you do it. Uh, but, 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 yes. But the, I mean, minus 70 or 80 percent. That's very extreme, and the, that's for top athletes giving it all. That's all in uh, for uh, six, seven, eight hours. Okay. Let's move to to diving then. Diving on diabetes, and this uh, picture is actually taken. Uh, a little north of here, uh, north of Vancouver and the Emerald Sea, Canada. I say close, close to me. Uh, and uh, what do we know about scuba diving and diabetes? Well, uh, worldwide we have more than one million uh, divers, and according to uh, Divers Alert Network, uh, about 1.5% do have uh, diabetes, and that gives us at least 100,000 uh, with uh, insulin dependent diabetes. Uh, and uh, the question is then is it dangerous to die when you do have diabetes? And uh, Gel uh, did a study here and also EDGE where they uh, assessed uh, 110 divers for 10 years. And they were really heavy divers doing a lot of dives that you could calculate yourself with almost 50,000 log dives. And here we saw no, no fatalities and no cases with the compression illness or DCI. And we know that also from, from divers without diabetes, the more uh, advanced or the more uh, uh, the more you dive, the less is the danger. So it's much, much more dangerous if you're a novel diver than an than a advanced and, and, uh, diver. And uh, also something that that uh, has been advocated is this with repetitive glucose monitoring 
and uh, that was Bergen uh, showing that first and then Lurch that uh, you should test 60, 30 and 10 minutes prior to dive and that is to give an idea where am I heading because uh, a low value descending is better than, than uh, a high value with a, start, with a sharp fall um, and we've adapted those a bit, which I come back to in, in a, in a uh, second. Astonishingly, uh, we used to have a ban for for uh, people with diabetes to dive until 1991, and then it was uh, softened in the UK first, and then here in the States. But still. Nobody really knew what was happening during a dive. Nobody has assessed uh, what happens with the glucose levels. And of course, you can imagine it's rather hard to, to test glucose underwater, so, so <laughs> I give you that. But uh, I thought it a bit strange, and, and um, I came across a, a pressure chamber here in Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, and uh, we use that to, to assess uh, this, and I, that, that, that's me, and this is a world record. I had 48 sensors on me at the same time, and this is actually the first uh, time they, they were used in, in, uh, in Europe, uh, so, and they were, were all handmade, and, and uh, uh, yeah, it's fascinating. And, and what we did is that we uh, had a, a protocol uh, for, for assessing the accuracy of these sensors, because we must know if they work in high and low pressures. So what we did is that uh, we pressurized the chamber down to 30 meters, that's uh, 100 feet, uh, which is the, the maximum depth for advanced open water driving or, or diving uh, certificate and then a safety stop, and then up to, to uh, sea level again. And then we did the opposite, uh, uh, went up to 5,500 meters, 18,000 feet in, in five minutes. And it was only me <laughs> going through this, uh, and without oxygen, of course, and then uh, down to 2,500 meters, and uh, that's uh, little excess of 8,000 feet, and, and that's actually the pressure in uh, an ordinary uh, aircraft. It's not uh, sea level, it's always 2,500 meters. And that's because uh, with this, uh, the tension for oxygen is lower, and thus the, the risk of fire is lower. Uh, and, and for us it was important to know that uh, glucose sensors works when you're up in the air. Uh, but we could actually show that, that uh, CGM works very well, both in, in hyperbaric and hyperbaric situations, uh, and, and uh, indeed better than, than uh, finger sticking. So if anything, you should trust your CGM and not the glucometer when you're up in the air. Um, and then uh, going from the controlled situation to the real life. Yes? Did you do any controls with finger sticks in the hyperbaric and hy hyperbaric chamber with uh, different uh, types of technology? Uh, there is uh, a, a sluice that you could uh, actually take out samples. Oh, okay. So what we did is that we did finger pricking uh, in the chamber, but we did the analysis outside. So yes, we did. Did you compare that with uh, finger pricking inside and outside? We don't have to do that. We know that, that uh, for every uh, 300 meters, you're 3% off uh, with, with uh, uh, a lower value in uh, on altitude. Glucose, on altitude. What about uh, under hyper? Uh, that we do not know. Because it, 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 it is of some importance for, for miners, yes. I used to do that a lot. Okay, but, but isn't, isn't that technology you know, sensitive? I mean, one technology of a meter versus another, I mean, they might not perform similarly. 
Yeah. Yeah. Why we did this is is we had to to make sure that prior to right. going into uh, a real uh, situation, we need to know that we could trust uh, the yeah. sensors. Right. So uh, we had a bunch of divers. This is only uh, half the group, and they were bodies. So one with diabetes and the body without. So that was the control, and they were 24 of overall. And they uh, went to this uh, diving camp, and uh, over a long weekend with with uh, five. Uh, the dives, and uh, here in purple you have the meal times, uh, the blue is the CDM for the uh, controls, and uh, the red is the CDM for uh, the type 1 diabetic subjects. And as you can see, there is a fall in each dive, and I would like to focus on that. And uh, there is an uh, average decrease of three mil moles uh, during a dive and these dives were one hour dive, 20 meters step in most Nordic conditions with eight degrees centigrade in the water that's below 15 so it's cold uh, and also there is a slight uh, decrease for, for uh, those without diabetes and again in the beginning they were, these were advanced uh, divers with many log dives uh, prior to the camp and they were asked to do what they used to do first and you see again that they say they got a little safety here uh, having themselves around 200 and then we asked them to, to not do that and uh, on the fifth dive we asked them to use our method instead to, to balance off and with that they do very well for diving excursions. Yes? So these were dry suit dives. Did you just have the CGM receiver inside the dry suit close to the, uh, the transmitter? So for wetsuit dives, have you ever tried putting the receiver in a waterproof mm -hmm. box? It, probably the RF wouldn't go through the water very well, but you could do spot checks by putting it right next to the transmitter, I would think. There is an Italian <coughs> group that has done that, but it's very, very difficult because uh, with the with the pressures, uh, when you go down to 30 meters, it's uh, four atmospheres. Uh, pressure, it's uh, four bars. It's a lot of pressure, and, and you will encounter uh, some some uh, technical problems because uh, it has to be ventilated. Uh, so so I don't see that as as a way forward but rather use it in, in, inside. I mean, a dry suit should be dry. Right. But for warmer water, is that nice? Yeah, but I, that we have not sold yet. <laughs> <laughs> but as you can see, in, in the end, it, it really levels off rather beautifully. And also, safety in diving. Uh, when you dive, there is not always a certainty that you could surface. It depends on, on how long you've been down and to what depth. And if you run into a problem, it has to be solved. And I, I saw in, in Sherry's book that, that she also has this uh, L sign which we uh, used. And, and also all uh, divers had this uh, glucose formulation, either gel or, or, or uh, solution. Uh, ready to be uh, uh, ingested. And you, actually, you could eat a banana uh, underwater. It, it uh, takes some practice. <laughs> and you have to swallow, and you have to you know, swallow quickly enough to not bite two big chunks in order to, to, to do this without uh, breathing. So, uh, but it works. Quick question about that. So when you open that, do yeah. you have water ingress into that thing because the inside of it, or, no. or is the pressure on the outside enough that it's basically neutral? It will be neutral. So, so and you, and it's, so it's no uh, air in there. You just sure. squeeze it and yeah. suck it in. And we did this with placebo, so so they they practiced it before uh, on shallow water. Yeah. I'm Steve Brosterman. I do 
pretty much all these things you talk about, which is great, and I love seeing your stuff. But one of the things we originally did when I was working with Bergen and Guys Work Network was to, uh, it, it was just interesting, I caught a, a message you just said about uh, not able to come up, but non-decompression diving is probably a pretty important um, issue. I noticed you're doing a lot of deep diving with advanced divers, which is great. And uh, I, I guess when you're doing this, to practice that is a really good thing. <clears throat> but it seems like it could be an undue risk to um, uh, to not say you should not do decompression diving. But what, is, what is the stand on that? Well, I, if we if we move around and say and look at at uh, non-diabetics. Uh, Today, there is, are very, very, very few people dying of decompression illness. <clears throat> so rather come up with a problem and act on it than not coming up at all. Uh, but I'll, I'll come back to, okay. to, my, to my conclusions of Dan uh, just in a second. And, and um, as you said, there are uh, current guidelines. We're working on the international guidelines, but this is as far as it's gone, and if we should then conclude on, on what's uh, in these damn uh, guidelines for recreational divers, it is of course to reduce the risk of, of acute uh, complications, hypo and hyper, uh, also not to forget the prevention of long-term complications, and work for enhanced uh, safety diving. Uh, it is utmost importance as we've been talking about monitoring and sufficient of glucose levels and also uh, we must understand that it's not possible to dive uh, if you do have that in all uh, countries or regions it's strictly prohibited for instance in, in, in Australia and New Zealand uh, despite the fact that they have the great barrier reef there and all that uh, as for other physical activity, you always try to, to, to uh, sequence your meal uh, two hours prior to the activity. Of course, you need to inform your body and your dying master and bring glucose paste or glucose formulation underwater. Uh, you do need to have carbohydrates readily available uh, at the uh, diving boat or, or at the diving site. And as you said, uh, avoid uh, diving uh, with with uh, the equal limits so that you can surface. And again, that that for for more extensive diving, uh, you must understand that that uh, the nitrogen narcosis mimics uh, those uh, findings or symptoms of of hypoglycemia. So. so it will be very hard to understand what what, and also for hypothermia, could also be this with slow celebration and, and uh, so. And as for everyone diving with hydration, and uh, here we have uh, a bit change the the sequence, and that is uh, to to be more uh, in line with with. Uh, Driving in, driving in a, in a dry suit, it will be difficult with two short uh, periods uh, here. And you could easily use the, the air load actually to, to assess the, the 10 minutes prior dive. Uh, it's, it, it will be hard with gloves and all that. And uh, last minute gloves prior to dive, 7 to, to 12, that is. 218 at the high level, and of course check plasma glucose again as soon as possible post time. And if you are into repetitive uh, diving uh, over a few days, if you go on a diving trip or so, please remind to reduce insulin doses overall. And regarding fitness to dive for a recreational diver. Well-controlled, that he did now with A1C of 
no macrovascular complications, no diabetic nephropathy, and no proliferative retinopathy, and no severe hyperglycemia in the last 12 months. And perhaps the most problematic thing to, to, to uh, detect is uh, unawareness. And, Therefore, in Sweden, all divers with diabetes, they do uh, at least one week with CGM to detect if they are prone to, to unawareness. And, then, and if so, you have to, to address that. And of course, a well-informed patient who, who knows to, to just uh, insulin doses and, and carbs. And the Swedish guidelines uh, that is been adopted, uh, has also been published internationally, and, and we are working for, for international guidelines. There's a conference here in, in uh, Mauritius here in, in September uh, where that will be addressed, uh, for instance. And regarding professional divers, uh, it is not allowed, uh, but, but exceptions do exist. Now, for the last couple of minutes here, moving over to, to something completely different. This is Leonardo da Vinci's uh, first draft of a, of a parachute. And uh, is it possible then to, to uh, go skydiving with diabetes? And uh, this is also an international sport with, with almost one million uh, skydivers, and they jump uh, some six million jumps on a yearly basis and uh, however in, in many countries it is a ban, it's forbidden for people with diabetes to, to jump and, and one could ask is this really medically justified? Uh, I've been asked by the uh, uh, International Parachute uh, Association in Toronto to look into this and, and when you jump you usually have a uh, climbing uh, with an airplane up to uh, jumping altitude, which is 4,000 meters, and that takes some 15 to <coughs> 25 minutes, depending on, on what airplane you have. And then you have you lie in the drop zone uh, to get cleared, and then you have a four-minute uh, jump, and that's one minute free fall and three minutes in in the parachute, and. Uh, is it likely that you have a hypo act during that time? No, it isn't. On the contrary, you will have this, what we spoke about initially, with, with the adrenaline uh, that will make your uh, glucose level soar. And again, uh, I was into the chamber, and here we could actually mimic the pressure chambers of a dive. Uh, and of course, we could also uh, readily monitor the physical and, and psychological parameters. So we, we actually uh, looked into cognitive tests. Now I'm going to show you some, some uh, slides that uh, is in print in a, in a paper. So uh, shared a little uh, with, with uh, caution. Uh, this here in green is the uh, ideal uh, pressure change. So you climb up, uh, and then the, the pressure will will uh, go down, uh, and you stay in the drop zone, and you fling yourself out of the airplane, and there you have the parachute, and you land. <laughs> and what we achieve then in our repetitive uh, jumps in the chamber was here in, in, in the black box or the black lines so we are uh, very well uh, simulating the, the, the real jump and uh, you also see here in, in, in blue and red the, uh, the separation uh, of the uh, non-diabetics and diabetics uh, during this so we can say that, that uh, we have a situation that very much simulates uh, a real jump. And they did six jumps in a day, which is uh, an ordinary uh, setup for, for a jumping day. 
and uh, the CGM values uh, for uh, uh, the non-diabetics looks like this, and uh, you have for the diabetics a little bigger excursions, but very well controlled. You have a little uh, increase here over after lunch, uh, but uh, again, we cannot see that that the glucose levels is is uh, a problem, and, and in fact, we we saw that those with diabetes actually had better make cognition tests uh, with uh, compared to the healthies. These are uh, actually all the, there are two out of uh, 12 who jumped for the first time. Yeah? Uh, so they were experienced uh, jumpers, but, but they, they, they said that it felt exactly like jumping uh, with uh, pressure wires. So, but again, while jumping, you really need to know what's upside, what's down, and you need to know what rope to, to pull that. So it's not only glucose uh, values, it's a lot more on the cognition, and uh, uh, you will soon be able to see this in, the, uh, in one of the journals out there. What other means are there for, for uh, helping out? Well, uh, I and Alan run sweet.com, has a lot of uh, information and he helps uh, athletes around the world doing crazy stuff like, like rowing across the Atlantic, etc. etc. Uh, so if you have a problem, one can always ask him. Uh, me and my team were doing these uh, camps for athletes uh, competing in endurance sports and it's, uh, we have something we call the Swedish Classic. Uh, we would be more than happy to join that. It covers uh, uh, 56 miles of cross-country skiing, uh, 1.9 miles swimming river, and you swim across the, uh, or against the current, so it's a lot longer, especially if you're not fast swimming. And the water is uh, around uh, 50, uh, it is hot. <laughs> uh, and then it's uh, 186 miles of, of biking, and then it's trail running, 18.6 miles. You have to do all of these four in one year. Uh, so it's uh, uh, it's fun, lots of fun. <laughs> but how should we do it then? Uh, well, it's like uh, the divers have, have something called "do it right," and, and you could apply this also here. <clears throat> have a meal two to three hours prior to your physical activity. Adjust insulin dose at and target at fat glucose levels at 90 to 144 milligrams per deciliter, not higher than that. <coughs> Monitoring your plasma glucose prior, during, and after your physical activity. And also add carbs prior, during uh, your physical activity, and have a meal as soon as possible after. Uh, and also be aware that for especially repetitive physical activity to reduce your basal insulin dose. So just get out there and do it, and do it right. Thank you. Thank you.